Welcome into the Action Network podcast. We are presented by FanDuel. I'm your host, Brendan Glasheen. Today's episode, NFL best bets for Super Wild Card Weekend. That's right, playoffs. Playoffs are here. We've got six games this weekend, two Saturday, three on Sunday, Monday night football featuring Bucks and Cowboys. The usual crew in the house, Brandon Anderson, Vegas refund, Luke Swain, and Jill Gallant. Fellas, home and road teams in the regular season, 50% exactly against the spread. Unders had their best year in close to, yeah, three decades. The best year for unders. And I thought this nugget, we'll hear more from Evan Abrams coming up. Good nugget here that he had. NFL playoff teams that have become smaller dogs throughout the course of the week. There are a couple teams that fit this category. They've gone 43-18-2 against the spread. 71% clip over the last 20 years. So we'll see if you guys are into any of those. Uh, We're trying to continue uh, to stay above 500 as far as our best bets record for the season. As a reminder, you can follow along in the Action app by following Action Network NFL Picks. And let's get into the picks. Brandon Anderson, you're up first, my friend. What do you have for us? Let's go right back where we left off Sunday night. Let's go to our hot read from Sunday. I like the Chargers then at Jacksonville. I like them still now. We got it at minus two, I think, on Sunday night. It dipped all the way down to minus one and a half, even one at some books. We're back up to two and a half right now. I don't think we're going to get to three, but I'd go ahead and grab this now before we get there. Obviously, a key number. And again, to recap the position from Sunday, it's all about the matchups oh. here. The big strength for the Jaguars is the passing offense. That's what they've really accomplished well. Well, Chargers passing defense is number two since the bye week by DVOA. So that's a good offsetting the strength. But on the flip side, Jaguars passing defense is bottom five for the season. Chargers numbers, eh, they're not all that great. A lot of the advanced metrics, that's because they've been really unhealthy for most of the season. And I know week 18, all the shenanigans, but mostly this is a pretty healthy version of the team. Justin Herbert is hot, healthy. Keenan Allen is healthy, and that's important more so than Mike Williams. I think the Chargers are going to have a field day passing all over this defense here, and I think their pass defense will really limit Jacksonville. So that was the hot read case. Then I dug a little more into it. So we remember, I think back in week three, Chargers play the Jaguars, and Jacksonville just crushed them 38-10. to 10. Well, so what do we do with that? You look back at it. So I look back at my notes. Justin Herbert was playing on a short week with injured ribs that game. We didn't even know if he would be playing. Rayshon Slater, the left tackle, left mid-game. So now you lose your star blocker. He's practicing, by the way. Corey Lindsley was out, star center. J.C. Jackson was out. Keenan Allen was out. Joey Bosa played 13 snaps. Then he was out. You just have to throw that game out. That's so many key players out or leaving in the middle of the game that you just can't take a lot away from it. So I don't worry too much from it. Jacksonville, when they played, let's call them real teams this year, a.k.a. (laughs) not their terrible division, right? They faced defensively the easiest schedule of any team in the NFL by DVOA. Six times this year, they faced an offense top half of the league. They're two and four. They won an overtime. They won a one-point game. But most importantly, in those six games, They allowed 30 points a game versus 15 and a half in all the other games. And their defense by DVOA ranked 31st in the NFL, both overall and against the pass. So I think this is a spot where the Chargers expose Jackson a little bit as as the young upcoming team. Uh, A trend that I noticed this week, if you just look at who is the home team in wildcard weekend, if that team made the playoffs last year, the trend says we should back them. If they missed, like Jacksonville did, the trend says we should fade that team. In the last two decades, those teams are 28 and 12 if you if you back the Chargers here against the Jaguars as the team that missed last year against the spread. So I like the Chargers. I like them Sunday as I dug into it this week. I just liked it more and more. It's my favorite bet of the week. Chargers 7-2 and two against the spread on the road this year. Third best team in the NFL on the road against the spread this season. When it comes to profitability, we'll find out what Justin Herbert is made of uh, on the road as an underdog. Uh, He's been good, uh, but this week, of course, he's a favorite where he's 500 against the spread um, for his career, making his playoff debut. 
On to Luke Swain. What do you have? First pick. So my first one's going to be the Chargers as well, um, which right now I believe they're laying two, two and a half, which really this is just tinkering around based off of, I think, the Mike Williams injury news, which it seems like he's trending in the right direction in terms of playing Saturday. No idea why he didn't practice yesterday. Um, I was honestly very surprised. So definitely waiting to see if he practices today, tomorrow. But everything we're hearing is Mike Williams be playing. Joey Bosa, full participant, so he's going to be playing. Uh, Staley playing as starters last week was definitely a highly criticized move, but looks like he might have gotten away with murder, to be honest, um, where this is just like pretty took a lot of my points, and I agree with everything he just said. Jags, right now, market expectation is at its peak. Five-game winning streak. But if you look at the quarterbacks that they've played in the last five games, you got Ryan Tannehill, five weeks ago, which that game didn't go very well. You got Dak Prescott, who is looking worse and worse as the weeks progress, where a <laughs> perception of Dak in that game is a lot different than what it is today. Mm-hmm. And then you got – then this is just what – this is like the gauntlet of awful, where you got Zach Wilson, Davis Mills, Josh Dobbs, and then and now they're in the playoffs. So, like, look, of any of those quarterbacks, I guess you could argue Dak maybe, but he's going to throw an interception 100 times um, where – none of those QBs are Justin Herbert, like anything close to Justin Herbert. And we are going up a step in class against a pass defense where this is really a pass funnel. No one wants to run on this Jags defense right now. And and it it just sets them up for failure. Like this pass defense is so bad and they are just an absolute sieve. And I, like Brandon said, their strength of schedule in terms of defense is like towards like the bottom of the league, which a lot of that has to do with the division they're in. But if you are looking at Justin Herbert, pass attempts, props, bet the over, love those. Um, but like everything Brandon said, this is just a Jags perceptional perception line way like at peak. And I see the Chargers who are very healthy right now relative to the rest of the season, um, spanking them, to be honest. If you are like the only advantage, it's a pretty, I guess you could say pretty big advantage is the coaching move. I guess you could say Pedersen is of the elite Staley, Last year, we thought it was late. This year, we think he's awful. Um, but it, I I love betting the Jags in Jacksonville. Like, as we've been saying on this podcast, like, weird things happen there. But I just couldn't find a reason, um, which, like, it's just Chargers are, like, the first one that I looked at. Done. Um, if you are scared of Mike Williams being out, bet the money line. It's a playoff game. It is what it is. Um, but, yeah, Jags minus two. Minus two and a half. Brandon Staley said earlier in the week he expects Williams to practice at some point, and they need good results, of course, from the MRI. This was a good nugget uh, from from the NFL. Heenan Allen and Mike Williams, when they're healthy together in four games where both have played 50-plus snaps, 50-plus percent of the snaps, Chargers 4-0, Justin Herbert, number one completion percentage in the league, just shy of 74%. Different-looking team. When both of those guys are out there, and as Brandon mentioned, Keenan Allen was not uh, not active when they met way back when early in the season, and Justin Herbert was hurt. Got to throw that out the throw it in the trash can is is the moral there. Okay, we're on to Jill Gallant. Your first pick. Yeah, I'm going to go with a Saturday game, but I'm going to move to the Seahawks and Niners, and I'm going to take an anytime touchdown bet, and I'm going to take George Kittle at plus one fifty, and Kittle surprisingly has 11 touchdowns this year. He's never had more than six in a season, but he's just been red hot with Brock Purdy at quarterback, seven touchdowns in his last four games. Uh, It's tied for third in the NFL for the 11 touchdown mark. Now, the last time the 49ers faced Seattle, Kittle went off four catches, two touchdowns, and he has caught now four touchdowns in his last two games against the Seahawks. Seattle as well has graded out as the worst DVOA team versus tight ends this season. They've allowed eight touchdowns to the position and a shit ton of receiving yards and catches. Now back to the Purdy connection in six games with Brock Purdy, at quarterback Kittle has 24 catches, 35 targets and seven touchdowns. He has been the guy for Brock Purdy in this offense. Now I expect the 49ers to run the ball most of the game, especially with their getting Debo Samuel back, but the Purdy Kittle connection is just undeniable. And if they're facing a Seahawks team that has just been so susceptible to tight ends, I have got to ride this. So I'm taking George Kittle for an anytime touchdown at plus 150. You you said 35 targets with mm-hmm. Purdy at quarterback for Kittle. 
Do you know how many of those are in the red zone? That would be 12. Wow. Oh, he just absolutely knew that. I love that. I kind of figured he did, Jill, uh, Luke. So I, that's why I, I went to the follow-up and put him on the spot. But if my math is correct, that's more than a third of his targets are coming in the, the red area, <laughs> which is where he scored touchdowns. Luke, you had something? And question for Jill. In turn, like this is the long game that like the weather could be an absolute debacle mm-hmm. where it, does the weather – like improve your thoughts on going to Kittle where it's like the conditions are so bad that you would think that he's going to take the easy dump off to which are going to be the tight end or does this make you more wary? No, if anything, it steers me more towards Kittle because of the A dot being a little bit lower uh, comparatively to say like Brandon Ayuk or maybe a Jawan Jennings. So that's kind of been the issue is that the slot has really been an issue for the Seahawks all year. And most of those times when it's a throw to the slot, it's usually a very quick pass, maybe to the knees, you know, to make sure there's no interceptions. So I still like Kittle in this spot, especially if the weather is poor, but I can understand the trepidation of whether or not you'd be considering him just because of the bad weather. They got to throw it at some point. So forecast is calling for rain and uh, clouds in San Francisco on Saturday. Temperatures in the 50s, high of 57, a low of 50. And that's your weather report like, from the host today. I think it always rains in San Francisco, like in the prime spots. Like hey. they're on Monday Night Football or whatever, it's raining. And then they're on Sunday and it looks like the nicest weather ever. Like Se- Seattle coming to town. If Seattle's in town, you got to bring the rain with them. Seattle yeah. Island is bringing the weather on the road. Just- or if anything, it helps the island drift even more there, Brandon. So I would be yeah. careful for what you're asking for. Let's go back to Brandon's second round of picks. What do you got? Well, I'm going to go to my Vikings game here. So I'm going to go with a Giants-Vikings one-score game. And here's what I mean by that. We'll explain a couple of different ways you can play this. At FanDuel, you can play Giants plus 6.5 and, and Vikings plus 6.5 in the same game parlay at plus 133. So I'm looking for either team to win by less than seven. Look, one score games is what these teams do. It's the one thing we know about the Vikings and the Giants. They just played a month ago and the whole game, it was a one score game the entire way. It never strayed past a one score game. The stats were pretty even. We literally had a walk off franchise record field goal for the Vikings. We talked about one score game back then a month ago. I think this is a matchup between Pretty even, pretty lucky to be here sort of teams. We've thought that all season about them. Kind of what drove me here is I bet kept, you know, been in the lab all week trying to figure out, okay, who do I like here? Do do I trust my Vikings as a fan? Do I look at the Giants, 13 and 4 ATS, best in the league? It's a very even matchup. I can't decide. Daniel Jones, awesome as a road underdog, as you heard from Evan Abrams. But Daniel Jones, debut quarterback in the playoffs. That's never a good thing. Giants, terrible against the run, but the Vikings are last running the ball down the stretch. Both teams can't play special teams. Both plays bad defense, low variance. They're just stuck that way. It's like, I can't figure out what the edge is here. Honestly, it's a gift for either one of these teams to get to move on to the next round of the playoffs. And I think that the the gift is to whoever gets to play them, San Francisco or, or Philadelphia next round, a late Christmas gift to them. But it brought me all back to, hey, look, I just think these teams are pretty evenly matched and we've seen them play this out all season. So far this year, between them, they have uh, Vikings and Giants, 24 one-score games between them this year. 24! You only play 34 games. So Vikings 11-0 in those games, Giants 8-4-1. So again, I mentioned there's a few ways you can do this. At FanDuel, you can play the same game parlay. Plus six and a half, both sides put that together. Some places you can play what's called like a tri bet, where you get maybe a five or less margin at about, at about plus 180. Now you're losing little points there. You lose the six, and six matters. We've seen that outcome a little bit. At FanDuel, if you want to widen your margin, you could go with eight and a half either way. So you get the true one score. And the Giants did have, I think, like four eight point games this year. You do that at minus 137. So you got some options. I just think it stays close. I think it's an even, wonky, weird, strange outcome game. I do, by the way, like uh, TJ Hawkinson here. Jill, you had a, a mm-hmm. touchdown or a prop for a tight end. I love Hawkinson over four and a half receptions. That's my top prop of the week. He's been over that in seven of nine full Minnesota games. Last time these guys played, 
13 catches, 109 yards, and two scores. And the Giants are second to worst against tight ends, only better than the Seahawks. So let's fade all these bad tight end defenses. But let's go with Giants Vikings, one score game plus 133. It's creative. I like it. There's another note from Evan Abrams in our uh, in his action write up. The Vikings are third in the NFL with a plus nine turnover margin on drives that have started in the fourth quarter or overtime. So that game script sets up for the Giants, but it also speaks to your point. The Giants have been lucky as well. But uh, yeah, the Vikings third in the NFL with a plus nine turnover margin on drives that start in the fourth quarter. That, that never mind the point differential for this team. That's under zero or below zero they're they're getting all the luck to begin the fourth quarter moreover jill you had thoughts yeah i was just going to mention with brandon about why reiterating kind of what he is saying about why hawkinson is such a solid bet either for receptions but also touchdowns is that the giants defense is one of the more predictable defenses they play the most man coverage uh, in the NFL of any defense. So guys like a Hawkinson are able to slip that there. Hawkinson doesn't really do as well against zone as he would against man. Same thing for Jefferson seeing Jefferson right now, a plus plus one ten for an anytime touchdown, pretty solid value as well. And Hawkinson plus two ten on FanDuel anytime touchdown score. Luke's up next second pick for the weekend. My second one is going to be giants plus three. I think it's Brandon's Vikings where this it's the same argument that we've been making against the Vikings the entire season. And I think the giants are becoming a pretty popular pick where we only got like, I think three games that have close spreads. So a lot of the popularity is going to be on a couple of sides in these like small spread games. But like three weeks ago, this line, like my trepidation is three weeks ago, this line was four and a half, four when they played where now it's three, which I do feel like three is a little bit more fair. Uh, but we just have a Vikings offensive line that is in shambles. And we have a, like, I think they might get Bradbury back. I'm not trending in the right way, but like still like the guards that they have are ranked at the bottom of the league. It's just a debacle. And the Giants are, Martindale's going to blitz the shit out of them. And then you got Dexter Lawrence. Like when we were, when I was betting this three weeks ago, I took the Giants for exactly the same reason I'm doing it right now. This D line's going to eat them. They're going to be in Kirk Cousins' face early and often. That did rattle him, it looked like the last game. Um, and this Vikings, like they have these stars that I think they have a lot of fantasy football stars. I'm not sure if they have a lot of stars that are actually good football players. Jefferson's going to get his. They they shut him down somewhat, I guess, relatively a couple weeks ago, I think. But either way, yeah, he did score. Where like he's going to get his, but at the same time, like Cousins isn't going to be able to get it to him when he wants to. Where in that game they didn't have Xavier McKinney, they didn't have a Dory Jackson three weeks ago. Those two guys matter, and they are going to be back. And this is just a Giants team that I think Daniel Jones is going to make plays. I'm terrified of the first start trend because that actually feels like a thing. Um, but at the same time, there are things working against Kirk Cousins as well, whether it's the primetime angle, which I think is just a total mush media angle that everyone hates on him for. But like the Giants are can't win this game. And the Vikings, it's just like the Vikings are lucky. The Vikings have a negative um, win margin, whatever it is. Like everything. Yeah. It, it, I'm sorry. I'm just like, it's just, I feel like a broken record, everyone going against the Vikings. And like, it's still the same case, even though everyone is on it. And I think for two weeks, every Giants fan I've been talking to is like, we got so lucky. Like we're going to, we got the Vikings, which like, I hope they're not jinxing it, but at the same time, like they're right. Like we've been waiting for this and the Giants can win. Like Daniel Jones can make plays. He's playing above his head. He's earned himself a contract next year. Saquon is going to shred him. They have no receivers, but that hasn't seemed to matter. Um, And it's just a Vikings team that, are a bunch of fantasy football stars that their weaknesses play to the Giants' strengths in terms of defense. So, yeah, uh, Giants plus three. So, <clears throat> Justin Jefferson, fantasy football star who may or may not be good at football, was limited, shut down. Other to than 12, him. 12 catches, 133 <laughs> yards, and a touchdown last yeah, year. Yeah, I was the, there was a game in that. I, I, I was like, I said that, and I, there was a game in that, like within like a week or two that he got the Packers technically... game. He got, he okay. got taken out in the Packers okay. game. And he's, it, yeah, which is actually, and that makes me like, that's good for this argument because he still went off and they still like 
Yeah. Giants still covered. Um, well, but Dalvin and, looks like a shell. Like, I think he's cooked, pun intended, but. <laughs> yeah, the, the Giants are, I think, dead last or second to last against wide receiver ones as well. So I think Jefferson has a big game. I might look for an alternate over there. But like you said, that didn't matter last game. The Vikings still barely got over the line. Like, as a Vikings fan, I tend to just not really do much on their playoff games because I just don't trust my rational fan side, irrational fan side, I should say. But in my notes, here's what I have. It's literally what you just said. I think Dexter Lawrence and Thibodeau and Ojolari are just going to destroy the offensive line. I'm very worried for that as a fan. I think McKinney and Adderay Jackson back is huge. And then one other thing, these teams just played a month ago. I don't really feel like Kevin O'Connell has shown us that much as a coach. Brian Dable has shown us a lot as a coach. He's going to have all the stops here. He's going to have the trick play. They just saw this defense. Minnesota is another very vanilla defense, very predictable week to week. Wink Martindale just saw Kirk Cousins, knows how to get to him. So I, I think New York is going to have a real coaching advantage and really win in the trenches. And yeah, the other thing too, I would say Giants plus nine, if you tease, that's my favorite teaser leg of the weekend. Tough lines this week, but I think that's a really strong teaser leg. That I, basically, that's kind of back to my one score thing. Giants just have to keep it within a score, or I think they may well win outright. And if you do like the Giants here, you should like the Eagles futures because the Giants get to play the Eagles most likely after that. It's so true, though. We Good discussed point. this game. We just talked about Jacksonville and Los Angeles, and much has been made of Brandon Staley and his decision-making. Kevin O'Connell hasn't been in the news because his team keeps winning. It's right. easy to dodge those questions when you're winning games. And the Vikings will put their 15 straight wins as a favorite on the line. Their last loss as a favorite was against the Lions, December 5th, 2021. <laughs> Brandon's like, oh, why, why are you sharing that that's, with me? That's terrible. Never, ever share that stat again. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, uh, I have a comparison. It's not even, it, like everyone, like everyone was fading TCU in college football year because they were like the lucky team. And like personally, I was always comparing TCU to the Vikings, like the even both wear purple and like the luck clearly ran out. I'm not saying that the Giants are the Georgia of football, but like the luck ran out and like we saw who they really were, and this could be that moment when it all like matters. So fucking it, it better be to be honest, but. <laughs> 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 like I, I think I think one of these teams ends with a close loss and then the other one loses by like 25 next week. So it's not going to be pretty either way you go here. Hey, Giants hung around with the Eagles last with week. Backups. Right? Yeah. With backups. 22 16. 16 and a half point underdogs. Uh, Jill, uh, your second pick. I'm looking forward to this one because you've had your eyes on this player <laughs> now for the last few weeks and the numbers juicy. Yeah, and it's I'm moving right this Sunday for Bills Dolphins in what I thought was going to be a fun matchup until I realized that two is not playing and now Skylar Thompson is going to be playing. So it most likely will be a Bills route. So I am going to be betting Dawson Knox anytime touchdown at plus 220. Now Knox has scored a touchdown four straight games, came through for me last week versus the Patriots. He also came through for me the last time they played the Dolphins when they hosted him in that snowball game in mid-December. So the Dolphins. We're getting a Dolphins team that ranks bottom five in DVOA versus tight ends. Uh, they've also given up the fourth most touchdowns to tight ends with 10. And the pricing is kind of why we have to keep betting Dawson Knox because he has now been over plus. I, I just don't get the pricing of why he's still over plus 200. I've always been vocal about if he's over plus 200, he's an auto bet. So he's been over plus 200 now this season for an anytime touchdown in nine games. And he has scored all six of his touchdowns in that span when it's over plus 200. He's also been a pretty strong red zone threat. He's not first on the team in red zone targets. That obviously goes to Stephon Diggs and Gabe Davis. But five of his six touchdowns have been scored within the red zone. He's also shown that he's a proven playoff performer. If you go through his game logs, he has scored four touchdowns in six playoff games and three in four home playoff games. So Dawson Knox for me, if you keep giving it to me over plus 200, it's an auto bet every time. So let's go. Could you could you give a devil's advocate answer as to why he's at that, that price? Pecking order. 
So when you've got Josh Allen at plus 130, you've got Stephon Diggs around plus 105, then you've got Gabe Davis at plus 110, then you've got Singletary there as well. They just yep. can't put every guy at plus 110 because the implied probability doesn't make sense. So somebody has to drop in that spot. Also the fact that this could be a blowout pretty quickly. The game might be over by halftime and the Bills might just knee, go down on a knee for the whole second half. True. He is a pass catcher and you have to throw the ball. And if you have a lead, you don't have to throw the ball as much. So that, that adds up. Okay. On to the last round of picks. We're going to go to Luke first to uh, take us home. So my first one, I'm going to go with the Buccaneers plus two and a half right now. Um, It might get to three by Monday. Um, I don't think you're really risking much waiting. Um, I think it's going to be two and a half, three, probably stays at two and a half. This thing really isn't going to move. There's no huge injuries. I don't think on the cusp, but I mean, this is the, I mean, the entire world is fading the Cowboys right now. And I think honestly, deservingly. So um, Dak has looked awful. Like everything about this Cowboys team it, it is just going in the wrong direction. Um, their strengths play to the Bucks' strengths. We're getting Vita Vey back. We're getting the cornerback. I'm sure Brandon will remember his name. I can't think of him off the top of my head, but like this Bucks team looked when they needed a win last week and Tom Brady was throwing the ball and they were being aggressive, things were happening. And you pray to God that left, which is going to do it again, which is a huge ask, but just like trusting him in general. But if he puts this ball in Brady's hands and he lets Brady rip it, his Dallas secondary is so bad. Like, and honestly, it's been so bad of recent weeks that their ranking is probably better than what it actually is, where if you just look at it the last couple of weeks, they're definitely the worst. Like they just, they just have a, like their second corner is just a body at this point. Like it could be me. Like it, it he like, it, like that's who they have. And that's what Brady's going to be throwing against. And like, this is at home against a struggling deck that there's just nothing about this Cowboys team. I can trust um, every time I've bet the bucks this year, I've told, I've literally told myself that they're blacklisted. Um, so here we go again, but like this just is a different spot. It feels like it's a corner they've turned going against a Cowboys team that Brady has their number. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's just like, you just have to do it. Like I, I've seen people like the Cowboys and I feel like they're just trying to go against the grain thinking that, and they're betting on the Cowboys on a team that they, who they can be, not what they are currently. Um, and that's just, I just don't, it's just silly to me. Um, yeah, bucks plus two and a half lines really not going to move. I'm going to wait and see if we can get a three. Um, but yeah, either one money line, whatever. Brady was mic'd up during the second half of the regular season finale. And he and Mike Evans were sharing how, uh, he's six and zero against the bucks. Tom, you, you did yourself short. You're seven and zero against the bucks in your career. Uh, the, the, the corner you're thinking of is Anthony Chesley who got placed on uh, injured reserve the other day. Mm. You mean Carlton Davis, maybe? Yeah, Carlton Davis is what I was thinking about. Oh, uh, okay. Well, they put another corner on IR like yesterday. So, shout out to Anthony Chesley. And they've the Bucks. Uh, the corresponding move move is they've promoted a, a linebacker, and they've signed rookie Duran Lowe to the practice squad. Oh boy. Um, <clears throat> but this feels like a game too that can be won by slot receivers. So Godwin of Tampa. And if Dak doesn't turn the ball over, can he get it to Noah Brown and or CeeDee Lamb in the slot? Brandon, you're next, and you're on the same page as uh, Luke. I am, yeah. To your point, Brandon, Dallas is dead last by DVLA against wide receiver two. So I do think Godwin has a big game in the slot here. I'm with Luke. I'm going to be on the Bucks plus two and a half. Like Luke, I'm going to wait. I have not put it in the app yet because I think we might get back to the three here. Early in the week, as I started to research here, all my trends were popping Tampa, Tampa, Tampa. And I was like, please, God, not Tampa. All season long, I've been dumping on Brandon Staley and Joe Lombardi and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And now here I am on playoff best bets. And those are my two picks. Oh, well, oh and hold on, hold on, hold on. Before you keep going, who did you compare Tom Brady to? Tim Tebow. And guess what? Tim Tebow won his playoff game that first oh, one as enough. a home playoff underdog in one of the spots here that popped for my trends. So let me start with some of the trends. I mentioned earlier in the podcast, the Jaguars are the home team that didn't make the playoffs last year. Well, home teams in this round that did make the playoffs, 25, 12, and three against the spread, 68%. Basically what that's telling us 
is if you made the playoffs last year and then you have a home game now, so you won your division, you're good. And we get a little too much recency bias on what's your win-loss record. And we kind of forget at this point of the year, all of those, you know, early in the season, the weird fluky wins and the lucky bounce and the walk-off field goal, they all played in. Everyone's 0-0 zero and zero now. And we know the Buccaneers are good. And week one, we're kind of back to where we started here, 19-3. to three. The Cowboys got held to under 250 yards, 3.8 yards of play. The Bucs defense really played them well. And I think that that holds up here. Tampa Bay's defense is actually number one in drive success rate. The Cowboys offense are only 24th in that. So they, basically what that's telling you is Dallas has to try to do these long grinding out drives. And we've seen it all year, right? Uh, Jill can confirm as a fan, we force we feed the ball to Zeke Elliott and we run, run, run. We have to establish the run. These are two of these are the two most run heavy teams left in the playoffs. I think Monday is going to be agonizing to watch as a fan or neutral because the one thing these teams do well defensively, especially is stop the run. But I think we're just going to keep feeding the run game, feeding the run game on both sides. But like Luke said, which side's going to go to the quarterback first? Well, probably the one with the goat. Tebow or not, I know who Tom Brady is. I like Brady over 42 and a half attempts here. Uh, that's 11 of the last 13 games he's done that, set the record for past attempts this year. So I think Brady gets to open it up and take control. Look, it's Byron Leftwich or Tom Brady. Who gets control in the big playoff game? Yeah. Brady's going to take over, and I think they get going. Box against good teams this year have actually played better. If you look at eight games against teams that have at least eight wins, like them, they're only two and six, but by DVOA, they're ninth best in the NFL, top 10 offense and defense in those games. This is the healthy version of the team. The offensive line's getting healthy. Even Ryan Jensen is practicing now, the star center. So I think that could help. And the one thing Dallas on defense is really great at is that pass rush. Tom Brady gets the ball out so fast that that doesn't even really affect him anyway. So they're going to get the ball out to all those playmakers who finally are healthy. And then just a couple more trends to throw on here. Uh, I've got a trends piece up for wildcard trends. Four of my seven trends on there all check off for the Bucs. They are the slam dunk pick from that one. Teams in the wildcard around 500 or below, 8-1 and one against the spread. 89% in the last two decades, including 6-3 and three straight up. One of those Tebow games there. Last six home dogs have mm -hmm. won outright. So that's that's a good one there. Teams are 15% worse by win rate or, or more, 6-0-1 oh, against the spread. And then you know all the Brady and Dak numbers. Dak has never covered in the playoffs, 0-4. Oh, Brady has an underdog in the playoffs, 3-0, and oh, ATS and straight up. Brady, since 2014, undefeated straight up as a three-point underdog or less, 22-7-2 and two against the spread in, in those games lifetime. So... I just think this is the spot for Tom Brady. I'm going to take the spread because I think that they could lose by field goal or lose by one or two. I think that's very much in the range of outcomes. So I'm going to stay away from the money line myself. Another teaser spot. My favorite teaser is that Giants Bucks teaser I mentioned. If you get Bucks plus eight and a half, Brady in playoff lifetime is 43 and four against that number. So that's wow. a pretty good looking teaser slot there. So I'll take the box plus two and a half. Todd Bowles spoke today, Carlton Davis on the shoulder. Bowles said he's good to go. He did return to practice uh, for the first time today. Good to go. The words out of Todd Bowles' mouth today. I've known Jill Gallant now for, for a few months and I'm starting to think, and it's added up to me now at this point in the year, if we ever find out what Jill's cause of death will be, it will just be Cowboys because what he's about to do now is just, you're a different kind of person here, my friend. Yeah, this, uh, Brendan is the emo hedge. And I think this is the only <laughs> bet you can make in this Love game. That. And that is Buccaneers money line at plus <laughs> 120. I'm a Cowboys fan. I have no problem mentioning it, but I also am realistic. And the Cowboys defense has fallen apart. It was very turnover reliant. Uh, they did lead the league in uh, turnovers forced, but uh, they were second in turnover differential behind the 49ers but they're just getting gashed on the ground and the air now. Like the Cowboys defense has given up the most passing touchdowns to wide receivers this season. And now I'm going to be going to New York, going to action studios, and there's going to be a camera on me during this game. You know, it's going to end up bad. You know, I'm going to be sitting there sobbing in the corner mm -hmm. and you know, the inevitable unsolicited Dak pick is coming right in your DMS. 
It's coming. That's why you know, because FanDuel has it right now at minus 180 for Dak to throw an interception. I track the interception props all year. He has never been above minus 120. So oh just God. to let you know the confidence in the sports book that that is happening, because he's also thrown an interception in seven straight games, nine of his last 10 overall. He's the most profitable quarterback this season for interception props. If you would just blindly bet him one unit every game, you'd be up 8.2 units of profit. Now, if we're just looking at trends like the Cowboys, and again, if you want to talk about heartache, they haven't won a road playoff game since 1993. They've lost eight straight road playoff games. And now you're facing Tom Brady with his career in the NFL playoffs at 35 and 12 straight up. He's only been a home dog once, and that was to the Chiefs in the Super Bowl that they won handily. Um, Brady is 7-0 and versus the Cowboys, 3-0 and straight up versus the Cowboys when Dak is the quarterback. We're talking about a little more recency results. Like I'm already pre-mad at the loss, and the game hasn't even been played yet. I mean, it, and Dak, like the inter- last week against the Commanders, like the it was like an out or whatever, and the Commanders corner just hit his chest and went off. Like, okay, he just got away with a pick six. Then the very next play, he throws the exact same pass and he picks it off for a touchdown. Where, like, that is like a level of like being broken. That like, like you made a mistake, you. Don't do that again. And he, it was, and he did it the very next play where it's just like he's good. It's just, it's something is off. And, and some of it isn't all on him. Like the coaching call, oh, yeah. I thought at the end of the Jacksonville game to throw it the way they did there in a, in a must have situation, in a short yardage situation. McCarthy hung him out to dry. Even I think one of the picks in the Tennessee game, that Thursday night game, was a tipped ball. So, of course. But okay, it but all, if you also, it yeah, all if you also goes on him, game right? Log for him, yeah. The people who he's throwing picks to, Commanders, bottom five in interceptions force. The Giants, last. They only had six interceptions all year, two of them on deck. Yeah. The end of Jill means the end of today's podcast, and we'll leave on that <laughs> note. Let's let's recap the picks, and then we'll get out of here. Brandon Anderson is on Chargers minus two and a half. He likes Minnesota. And the Giants, a one-score game, same game parlay over at FanDuel. You can find it. You have to do some digging. But essentially, you're taking the Giants plus 6.5, the Vikings plus 6.5, parlay that to plus 133, and he's on Bucks plus 2.5. Luke is on the Chargers as well, minus 2.5, Giants plus 3, Tampa plus 2.5. Jill Gallant with not one, but two anytime touchdown picks. He likes George Kittle against the Seahawks at plus 150. Dawson Knox, he's over that plus 200 number at plus 220. And Jill is uh, really uh, twisting the knife in himself with Bucks plus 120. He already thinks the game already happened. So Jill uh, just won you some some cash on the Bucks plus 120 pick. That will do it, everybody. Uh, here on the Action Network podcast, we are presented by FanDuel, our NFL Super Wild Card Weekend Best Bets episode. Thanks to Brandon Anderson, Joe Gallant, Luke Swain for joining me. I'm Brendan Glasheen. Best of luck with your bets this weekend. We'll see you for the recap episode on Monday night. We'll do it Monday night, Tuesday morning, whatever uh, works for you. We'll talk to you once the weekend ends here on the Action Network Podcast.